a reading from the prophet Isaiah. If you are thirsty, come and drink water. If you don't have any money, come, eat what you want. Drink wine and milk without paying a cent. Why waste your money on what, is, what really isn't food? Why work hard for something that doesn't satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and you will enjoy the very best foods. Pay close attention. Come to me and live. I will promise you the eternal love and loyalty that I promised David. I made him the leader and ruler of the nations. He is, was my witness to them. You will call out to the nations you have never known, and they have never known you, but they will come running because I am the Lord, the holy God of Israel, and I have honored you. Turn to the Lord who can still be found. Call out to God who is near. Give up your crooked ways and your evil thoughts. Return to the Lord our God who will be merciful and forgive your sins. The Lord says, my thoughts and my ways are not like yours. Just as the heavens are higher than the earth, my thoughts and my ways are higher than yours. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God spoken to us, for the word of God in Jesus, thanks be to God. Please join me in reading the solemnity. O oh God, you are my God, eagerly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you, my flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Therefore I have gazed upon you in your holy place, that I might behold your power and your glory. For your steadfast love is better than life itself. My lips shall give you praise. So will I bless you as long as I live, and lift up my hands in your name. My spirit is content as with the richest of foods, and my mouth praises you with joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the night watches, for you have been my helper and under the shadow of your wings I will rejoice. My whole being clings to you. Your right hand holds me fast. The second reading is Paul's first letter to Corinthians. For we must never forget, dear siblings, what happened to our people in the wilderness long ago? God guided them by sending a cloud that moved along ahead of them, and he brought them all safely through the waters of the Red Sea. This might be called their baptism, baptized both in sea and cloud. As followers of Moses, their commitment to him as their leader and by a miracle, God sent them food to eat and water to drink there in the desert. They drank the water that Christ gave them. He was there with them as a mighty rock of spiritual refreshment. Yet after all this, most of them did not obey God, and he destroyed them in the wilderness. From this lesson, we are warned that we must not desire evil things as they did nor worship idols as they did. The scripture tells us the people sat down to eat and drink and then got up to dance in worship of the golden calf. Another lesson for us is what happened when some of them sinned with other men's wives and 23,000 fell dead in one day. And don't try the Lord's patience. They did and died from snake bites. And don't murmur against God and God's dealings with you as some of them did, for that is what, why God sent the angel to destroy them. All these things happened to them as examples, as object lessons to us, to warn us against doing the same things. They were written down so they could read about them and learn from them in these last days as the world nears its end. So be careful. 
If you are thinking, oh, I would never behave like that, let this be a warning to you, for you too may fall into sin. But remember this, the wrong desires that come into your life aren't anything new or different. Many others have faced exactly the same problems before you, and no temptation is irresistible. You can trust God to keep the temptation from becoming so strong that you can't stand up against it. For God has promised this and will do it. God will show you how to escape temptation's power so that you can bear up patiently against it. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God spoken to us, for the word of God in Jesus, thanks be to God. Morning, kids. Say you're sorry. Has anybody ever said that to you? I might have said that before. Uh, <laughs> I see Thomas pointing. Um, how about repent? Has anybody ever said that? If, you, if I see any hands raised, I'm going to be a little surprised. So today we hear stories about Jesus uh, telling people to repent. We also hear Isaiah talking a bit about repenting and uh, Paul a little bit too. But I wonder what that means and, and why that's important. I have a story that is maybe helpful with that. So um, back when your parents were kids, I was a kid, uh, in South Africa there, was, there were terrible laws called apartheid that um, kept people apart. They kept uh, black people and white people separate, and they made life terrible for black people. Um, and there were some uh, amazing leaders and people who helped to end that. And uh, when they changed everything, um, they said, okay, well, how do we heal? How do we heal? And one of the leaders who was really important in um, making that change was Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Um, I got a chance to meet him, which was really cool. I'll tell you about that another time. But um, he, so afterwards, they decided what we need are truth and reconciliation committees, which are a little bit hard to swallow. But basically, it was saying people, a lot of people have done a lot of terrible things. We need truth. We need this to come to light. We need people to confess. And we need opportunities for forgiveness and reconciliation. And just uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu um, died right at the end of last year, but I heard an interview with him, and he said that he was on th this Truth and Reconciliation Committee, and he saw people come and tell what they had done. And he talked with some of them afterwards and said, how do you feel? I feel so much lighter. My heart is in a better place. My heart has changed. And it kind of opened up the door to um, forgiveness, to healing, and to peace. And I wonder if the reason that Jesus is saying repent, he's not saying unless you repent, I, will, I won't love you. God's going to love us whatever we do. But he knows that that's the, what we need to do to heal, and that's what is needed for peace. And that's what's needed for us to have a good relationship with God and with everyone else. Thanks. Return to the Lord your God, who is great. 
This is the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. A crowd was gathered by the thousands, and at that very time there were some present who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Jesus asked them, Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree and planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, See here, for three years I've come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit afterward, well and good, but if not, you will cut it down. For the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God spoken to us, for the word of God in Jesus, thanks be to God. A few of you might recall Peter Fribley, whom I knew in another time and place, who was once described to me as having the most amazing eyebrows in the entire synod. He would frequently remark about the New York Times obituaries. His line was, you don't read to see who died, you read to see who lived. Incidentally, I also think about Peter Fribley every time we use this ELW service of the word liturgy. When ELW came out, he was infuriated at the words in the prayer we'll do next that didn't square with his Presbyterian theology or his background as an army chaplain, maybe then witnessing war in Iraq, that God would bring beauty out of chaos. He insisted it was order that God could bring from chaos. Anyway, not reading to see who died, but who lived, may be analogous to what Jesus is saying in this gospel reading. I know it can seem strangely brutal that he says, repent or die. Unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Clearly, he's not saying repentance will spare you from death, huh? At the least, we know we're going to die. His point is that Worse things don't happen to worse sinners. God isn't tipping towers over on rotten people. Victims of violence didn't have it coming. Jesus doesn't believe in divine punishment. And he should know, huh? Pat Robertson infamously regularly claims he knows otherwise, attributing disasters to the LGBTQ community, or abortion, or God's hidden operations through violence, or because people are brown and black, or most anything else other than being willing to accept some of the blame himself. Jesus shuts this out entirely. Even if we'd typically claim that bad things aren't punishment from God, as if God were lurking to smite, catching us misbehaving, we nevertheless also wonder how to escape calamity and avoid death in personal habits or health care plans or military spending. When tragedy strikes violently or accidentally, we find ourselves wondering, why? Why did it happen? Why did God let this occur? Even, what did I do to deserve having a bad day? Jesus doesn't really answer in this reading except to say, tragedy isn't punishment. That may or may not feel like relief. You may still want to protest. It's not fair. The most frequent upset in these days being that God is allowing Putin to get away with mayhem and carnage against innocent Ukraine. But Jesus says God doesn't operate in that way. God goes by grace. One writer phrased it that we say there's no such thing as a free lunch, but God in divine grace says there is. If you don't have any money, 
Come, eat what you want, it said in Isaiah. You can be a worthless, worn-out fig tree, but God will keep pouring fertilizer on you, keep you on life support, giving you another chance. The Lord says, my thoughts and my ways are not like yours in Isaiah because our thoughts are about getting what you deserve, about punishment, always circling around tragedy and death. God, though, is more interested in life than in death. Jesus will himself suffer, be cut down, crushed, bloodied, but even that tragedy is in service of life. So repentance, in finding our minds transformed, sees that preoccupation with death isn't worthwhile. Getting sucked in by the tragic isn't God's perspective. Though we might imagine we're staving off the inevitable for a time, we eventually have to confront that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to the intelligent, nor favor to the skillful, but time and chance happen to them all, as it says in Ecclesiastes, for no one can anticipate the time of disaster. We're not left as existential nihilists to throw up hands and say, well then what's the point? Rather, we have God's question in Isaiah, why waste your money on what really isn't food? Why work hard for something that doesn't satisfy? To go chasing after answers that will never appear and frantically and frenetically thinking we can evade and avoid death does not satisfy. It's a waste, leaving us with buyer's remorse, or in Jesus' frame, liver's remorse. We get to the end and have failed really to live, focusing the obituary on who died rather than who lived. It's not really sufficient to boil this down to the little truism that nobody on their deathbed ever said, I wish I spent more time at the office, but there's something to that. How do we spend our lives? Or what do we spend them on? If God is invested in you living, is it only being toward death, or is it for the sake of life? Again, with the obvious example, we can be sad and overwhelmed and shocked about Ukraine. We could waste time wishing that Putin would suffer consequences and repercussions, that war criminals go straight to hell, as the U Ukraine UN ambassador opined. Or we could let God renew our perspective and witness that beauty can indeed Come out of the chaos, the love of neighbor, the resistance of peace. We could focus on the death, or we could find ways to join in supporting life and relief and hope. Again, I wouldn't typically condescend to equate Jesus with a meme on Facebook, but here we go. With a picture of gas prices, this week I saw saying, so today I stopped and filled up my car, and I was thankful. Thankful that I have a car. Thankful I have money to buy gas. Thankful there are no warplanes flying over me. Thankful that I will be eating soon. Thankful that all of my loved ones are safe and sound. Thankful that the air I breathe is not filled with smoke and gunpowder. Thankful that I will sleep in silence and wake to a beautiful day. Now that could just turn to be self-satisfied schadenfreude or even a gloating sort of patriotism, but it could also be repentance, a change of perspective, a transformed mind that sees life instead of death. And even when we do see death, when we can't ignore its reality, when tragedy really is inescapable and diminishing of life, still we are reoriented by baptism that you have already died with Jesus by baptism into death, so that with him you may walk in newness of life. Amen. Oops, this is still me. I invite you to stand as we give thanks for the word. 
Praise and thanks to you, holy God, for by your word you made all things. You spoke light into darkness, called forth beauty from chaos, and brought life into being. For your word of life, O God, we give you thanks and praise. By your word, you called your people to tell of your wonderful gifts, freedom from captivity, water on the desert journey, a pathway home from exile, wisdom for life with you. For your word of life, O God, we give you thanks and praise. Through Jesus, your word made flesh, you speak to us and call us to witness, forgiveness through the cross, life to those entombed by death, the way of your self-giving love. For your word of life, O God, we give you thanks and praise. Send your spirit of truth, O God, rekindle your gifts within us, renew our faith, increase our hope, and deepen our love for the sake of a world in need. Faithful to your word, O God, draw near to all who call on you, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory forever. Amen. Salvation belongs to our Lord and to Christ the Lamb forever and ever. Great and wonderful are your deeds, O God of the universe. Just and true are your ways, O ruler of all the nations. Who Please join with me in reading this statement of faith and I think also of life. Like countless believers around the world, on Sunday mornings I affirm that Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. It can imply that Jesus came to earth only to suffer and die. Didn't he also come to live, to embody life, and life more abundant? I wish the creed included a few more lines. I believe in Jesus, who squealed with joy on Mary's lap, climbed trees and learned to swim as a child, played pranks and laughed with his friends. I believe in Jesus, who considered the lilies, gazed at the stars, sang around campfires, cherished fresh bread, savored good wine. I believe in Jesus, who read poetry and told the best stories. I believe in Jesus who lived. In these days of pandemic and pain, we need more holy delight as sacred and honorable gift from God, honoring the whole of human experience we acknowledge the reality of pain and death, but our faith is not about pain and death. It's about life and joy. It's about a God who died so that all creation can live abundantly. Life is many things, 
And yes, it includes pain, but not to the exclusion and neglect of joy. To follow Christ is to embrace Christ's joy and to trust that God will make that joy complete in us. Amen. And my name's on this. <laughs> the peace of Christ be with you always. We join together in a time of prayer, and each of these petitions will end with the words, God of mercy, and you can reply, hold us in love. God of mercy, hold us in love. Let us pray. In this season of spring cleaning, create in us clean hearts with the fertilizer of your love, that we may live in the baptismal promise, not toward death, but of new life. God of mercy, hold us in love. As you renew us, renew also creation with rejuvenating rains and strong soils. And for all life in spring, God of mercy, hold us in love. Make all governments thirst for your justice, faithful God. We pray that your abundance of grace is effective, especially when we'd prefer punishment. We pray for Ukraine and for Russia. God of mercy, Hold us in love. Fill the cups of the thirsty, faithful God. Fill the plates of the hungry. Give peace to all who mourn and healing to all who live with mental illness. Be with all who strive for health, especially Howard Konetsky and Lucetta, Joanne Streit, Julie Wilkie, Paul Kent's grandson, Casey, Acacia's friends, Uncle Wally, Jay Kemp's sister, Lori Demise, Virginia Stumbo, and Sherry Hansen, God of mercy, hold us in love. We pray for a community of hope as they have a listening session this morning and for the time of transition. And we pray for the ease of MCC this week. Carol Fainick and Peter Werley, Shanti Goppert and Rob, Oren Fettis, Julie Wilkie, Chris and Paul Wilkie, Al and Lindy Wilson, God of mercy, hold us in love. In the face of tragedy and death, renew your life in us. We pray amid all our grief, including tragic deaths from war and disaster and pandemic, make your promise bigger than all of that. God of mercy, hold us in love. For all of these prayers and whatever else you see that we in our world need, we trust ourselves into your eternal life and care as we pray the words you taught us, saying, Holy One, our only home, hallowed be your name. May your day dawn, your will be done, here as in heaven. Feed us today and forgive us as we forgive each other. Do not forsake us at the test, but deliver us from evil. For the glory, the power, and the mercy are yours, now and forever. Amen. We turn now to a time of announcements for the community. If anybody has anything to share, you can come on up. Yes, Sulia. Hi, my name is Sulia Miller, and my confirmation mentor is Lisa Hoffmeister. And for our project, for our confirmation pro project this Lent, we're collecting new or lightly used art supplies to donate to children and families in need. We have a bin set up next to the Welcome Center, and so anytime in the next couple weeks, if you have art supplies that you're not using or you need to get rid of or want to get rid of, we would greatly appreciate them. Thank you. Thank you, Sulia. And 
Uh, stay tuned, the confirmation students mentors will be scheduling a market day. Last year uh, it happened out in the parking lot on a rainy morning and we're hoping for better weather and trying to do it either after a Sunday morning worship service or a Wednesday before a Wednesday evening worship service. So uh, keep your eyes tuned for some good things and chances to interact with them and support their projects. Uh, that's also a reminder, Lent and Wednesdays continue uh, as we are back to a little bit of singing. This Wednesday will be your first chance to be in this room and sing some of Holden Evening Prayer. Uh, those of you who are at home, maybe you're already singing it, and so you can continue on. Uh, 5.30, the labyrinth is open. The Stations of the Cross coloring posters are uh, part of our Lenten journey, and Holden Evening Prayer at 6.30 with some amazing ongoing uh, MCC reflections on our life together. So they've been just beautiful so far. Uh, you might even go back and watch the previous recordings on Facebook if you haven't caught those. Uh, you see a uh, Ukraine support slip in your bulletins uh, through ELCA disaster response. Uh, you can make checks out to Advent and Markham Ukraine if you like and we can get them sent off together. Uh, we're also working on uh, figuring out some of that with your benevolence dollars, a chunk of money just from our annual contributions. More on that soon. This evening at, what, 6 o'clock, I think? 6 o'clock uh, is a movie viewing. Uh, the Dane Sanctuary Coalition is doing a big view, so we've done big reads. This is a big view, people all over town uh, watching six parts of a series on living undocumented. Uh, so we're going to watch three of them here tonight, starting at 6 o'clock. You can plan a little less than two hours for that if you want to join with others for watching. Uh, we'll do another, the other three next week. You can also find it on Netflix if you want to be watching on your own and spreading it out or something like that. Uh, intern Lisa said this week that, that it can be a lot to absorb all together, but that they also flow together. So a plus and a minus maybe on, on watching tonight at 6 o'clock conversations then the next two Thursdays. So this coming Thursday we'll discuss the first three and a week from now we'll discuss the other three. This morning, uh, besides getting the chance to sing again with our new regathering protocols, we also resumed adult ed for the first time in more than two years. So 915 adult ed if you want to be part of those. Uh, we had some good conversation this morning on some of the shape for the rest of spring. Uh, and I hope that you can be part of those gatherings. I have a list of birthdays here. I have uh, Kathy Johnson birthday today. I had a Kathy Henning birthday earlier in the week as she tried to avoid it last Sunday, she said. Uh, Ann Ward was this week. Robin Thoreau and Jim Eastman were yesterday, and Eliza Meyer also today. I see any other birthdays or anniversaries we should celebrate. Uh, Lisa Ann today, too, okay. They're traveling off in an RV, so we'll have to give a really... I guess we could sing, couldn't we? Are you ready for that? Is that okay? Surprise! <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Huh. Thank you, Sybil. I think that's all I've got, so I invite you to stand and receive God's blessing. May you live as long as you want and never want as long as you live. May you live to be a hundred years with one extra year to repent. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.